Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, fellow children of God. Not too long ago, I remember watching this video. And it was a video of a guy who was building a pyramid out of dominoes. So if you ever tried to make a, a house out of playing cards or something like that, it was, it was along those lines. But, but this was a big project because this thing was pretty big. It, in the video, he had it set up in a back room somewhere. And, and the base of this pyramid looked like it started out about maybe four or five feet wide by four or five feet deep. And, and it looked like it was going to be about four or five feet tall. And it was clear this guy spent a lot of time working on this. And, and the video was of him just putting some more pieces on. But what had happened was he must have accidentally bumped one piece or one piece on the bottom, because all of a sudden, in a matter of seconds, this whole pyramid came crashing down to the ground. And you could just see the defeat on this guy's face. He had spent hours and hours working on it, and now it was just a pile of dominoes. He had to clean up the mess. He had to either just give up on it altogether or start over from scratch. And maybe there's been points where, where, where you've experienced that frustration where it seems like all the work was for nothing. Maybe you spent some time waxing and washing the car and, and it's all nice and shiny, but then as you drive out of the garage, it starts to rain. Or, or maybe you spend a lot of time planting and weeding and taking care of a garden and, and everything's growing great but one morning you walk outside and, and all the plants have been eaten down to nothing more than little knobs sticking out of the ground. Or maybe you, you spend all afternoon making a big fancy birthday cake, you know, with all the decorations on it and, and as you're walking out the door, out of the kitchen door into the living room, everybody's singing happy birthday and it slips, and it falls, and of course it falls upside down. Or maybe you spend some time setting up you know, a, a tent or something, some sort of a shelter, so that family and friends can come over and celebrate 4th of July with you, but then the wind comes up, and it blows it up down. And the list could probably go on and could probably supply your own example, but we, we, we understand that frustration when we work so hard and then it seems like it's all for nothing. And then as we look at our scripture reading for this morning, we, we, we think of Jesus. And think of that for a minute, how, how much frustration at times he must have felt because Jesus came into this world to do what no one else could do. He came to offer the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all people. He came to shed his blood so that he could take this gift of free forgiveness and offer it to the whole world. And yet, even during his ministry, there were people who said, Well, no thanks, Jesus. I have my own good works. I have my own righteousness that I can offer to you. And how many times throughout the history of the world hasn't that same thing happened where this message of free forgiveness goes out into the world and, and people respond by saying, eh, I don't think I need it. I think I'm good enough on my own. Imagine that frustration that's there when, when Jesus offers this gift of salvation, but it seems like he did it all for nothing. But in our scripture reading for this morning, the Apostle Paul reminds us not to take that gift for granted. Because what Christ has done, and only because of what Christ has done, he reminds us to remember that we are dead to sin and alive to God. This new life in God's kingdom comes entirely as a gift because we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And because what Christ has done for us, we live because Christ lives in us. Uh, Paul wrote in his letter to the churches in Galatia, and I'll start about halfway uh, at verse 15. He writes, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, 
know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of our Lord. Now, the first part of this lesson, which I didn't read right now, Paul talks about how he had to confront Peter because of something that Peter was doing. And just sit back and think about that for a moment. You know, when we think about Peter, that's the same Peter who was one of the 12 disciples who had been with Jesus throughout his ministry. Peter was one of the guys who had been there and sat at Jesus' feet when he proclaimed the Sermon on the Mount and, and when he performed miracles. Peter was there and he was a witness to the empty tomb, to the fact that Christ had risen victorious. And Peter was a guy who stood up on the day of Pentecost and had that crowd of thousands listen to him as he proclaimed the gospel. And so I think it's safe to say that Peter had a pretty solid reputation and had quite a bit of clout among the Christians. But at the same time, as, as our lesson states, Paul was bold when he came, to, and he said, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. When it came to God's word, Paul was even ready to speak to, confront a guy like Peter. Well, the question is, well, what, what was so wrong that Peter had done? I mean, what was he doing that, that caused confusion? Well, Peter, because what Christ had accomplished, understood what Christian freedom was. And he had come to visit the city of Antioch, and this is the one that's a couple hundred miles north of Jerusalem, so it's a pretty good ways away uh, from the Is Israelites. And he understood his Christian freedom while he was there so that he was able to sit down and have a meal with his fellow believers, and, and, and he understood that all those Old Testament rules and regulations that govern the Old Testament people, because they had been fulfilled in Christ, no longer applied anymore. And so he was willing to sit down and eat food that had been off limits for the Israelites before this. He was willing to sit down and have a ham sandwich with his fellow believers. And that was all well and good as long as no one was looking. But when there were visitors that came up from Jerusalem who probably still were stuck on some of the Old Testament rules and regulations, and all of a sudden, Peter started to shy away. And all of a sudden, the people who had once sat down to have a meal with him and, and not follow those rules and regulations, all of a sudden thought, well, maybe there's something to that. In other words, they're tempted to think, well, do we really have to follow those Old Testament rules and regulations instead of keeping focused on Christ, they were tempted to think, well, maybe, just maybe there is something that we need to do. And the reason that this was so important was because anything that takes the focus off of Christ and his work can be dangerous. Anytime we take our focus off of the cross and the empty tomb, we're tempted to think about our righteousness coming from ourselves. Now, we might not have the Old Testament rules and regulations to worry about anymore, but 
Sometimes, you know, that's the human nature that can sort of pop up in our human way of thinking. Well, why do I get to go to heaven? Well, well our answer might be, well, because I go to church every Sunday. Or we might say something like, well, you know, I know I'm a good Christian because I, I find a charity every year that's a trustworthy charity and I support it. Or we might be tempted to say, well, I know that I don't have any of the vices that so many of the other people around me seem to have. Now, don't get me wrong, all those things are very good things and they're very beneficial things. However, when we turn our eyes towards them and trust in what we do in order to be assured of our place in God's kingdom, then they become very dangerous. Because instead of focusing on Christ, on his cross and on his empty tomb, our human neighbor is tempted to focus on ourselves. And, and, and when we depend on ourselves, when we focus on ourselves, when we focus on what we can do to earn God's favor, then it's sort of like telling Jesus, oh, don't worry, Jesus. You did that all for nothing. I got it covered. That's why Paul writes a little bit later in the same letter, you who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. It isn't a little both. It's one or the other. Either we're saved by what we do, or we're saved by what Christ has done for us. And so Paul gives us that reminder, don't trust in what you can offer God, but instead trust in what Christ has offered you. If we take the focus off of Christ, there's all sort of uncertainty, there's all sort of doubt. If we, if we try to trust in our own work, we can never be sure if we've done enough. And so, especially in our lesson for this morning, God pushes us, he tells us, to focus on what Christ has done for us. And, and when we look at Jesus, then we see someone who was able to keep every one of God's laws in our place. That's why Jesus told his disciples, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus kept his life perfectly free from every sin and guilt. And when Jesus came to fulfill the laws, he not only fulfilled the Ten Commandments, the moral law that God has instituted for people of all time, but he also came to fulfill those civil and ceremonial laws which were meant to keep the people's hearts and minds focused on the Messiah who was coming. What I mean is, just like the Lamb's blood was shed every morning and night at the tabernacle and the temple, just as the Lamb's blood was shed at the celebration of the Passover, Jesus came to be the Lamb of God who shed his blood for the sins of the world. And just like the high priest would ceremonially put the sins of the people on the scapegoat every year on the Day of Atonement, Jesus willingly bore our sin. He took our sin on it himself so that it could be taken away and never return. And the book of Hebrews goes on to explain it this way. Nor did Christ enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Because Jesus was willing to allow himself to be declared guilty for us. He endured the punishment of every single one of our sins. The big ones, the little ones, and everything in between. He paid the price for every single one of them. And because Jesus rose from the dead, now we have been declared innocent in God's courtroom. That's what that term, justified, means. It's a courtroom term of being declared not guilty. And the wonderful thing is, if God, the eternal God, in his courtroom has declared us not guilty, 
There isn't any other court that can overrule what he has said. God has declared us innocent so we can live as his people. And this declaration of innocence changes how we live. We don't live because we think we need to earn or merit something before God. Instead, we live in thanksgiving for the salvation, that, that forgiveness that God has already won for us. And we want to grow in our ability to live as God's people. And that's important because as we live in this world, there are a couple temptations that we face when it comes to uh, remembering God's forgiveness. One temptation that we face is our human nature wants to go back to the natural religion of, of our human heart. And once again, that's a religion that says, but you have to contribute something. You have to claim some credit, even if it's for some small little part of your salvation. And one way our human nature might be tempted to do that is by saying, well, at least I had to choose Jesus, or I had to ask him into my heart. And, and so that faith that God gives us ends up being a good work that we claim credit for ourselves. But then God reminds us that even that faith that we have in Jesus, that comes to us as a gift, as Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even our trust in God comes to us as a gift of his power and grace. On the other side of the same coin, another temptation we face is, is to think, well, this free forgiveness that God offers us, well, that means that we live our lives however we want. Instead of turning to our own self-righteousness, we turn to our sinful nature. But as we go back to God's word, we see that because Christ has called us to be his very own, he wants us to use his word as our guide every day of our lives. Even though this salvation, even though this forgiveness comes as a free gift to us, we want to remember the price paid for our salvation wasn't free. Even though it's free to us, someone else had to pay for it in our place, and of course that was Jesus. That's why we also read in 1 Corinthians. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Because God has made us his very own, because he has given us this gift, we want to live as God's own. Not because we have to, not because we think we've earned anything by it. We, we already have everything. Because we have a place in God's kingdom. But all the thankfulness for what God has done, we want to live as his people. As we also read in Romans, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We want to live in a new life. Now, at the same time, we, we do realize that because we still have that sinful nature clinging to us as long as we're living this side of heaven. Yeah, that's going to be a battle. That's going to be a struggle. And there are going to be plenty of times when we stumble. There are going to be plenty of times when we fall. There are going to be plenty of times when we give into temptation. But the wonderful thing is, is that even when that happens, we can go back to the well of our salvation. We can go back to Christ and his promises. For that matter, we can go back to our baptism. Because at our baptism, God made us a wonderful promise. And through those words of forgiveness, God can enable us each day to live as his people. Uh, Luther's small catechism gives us a little bit of help and direction at this point. It says, baptism means that the old Adam in us should be drowned by daily contrition and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. That's all God's work. The forgiveness that we have, the faith that we have in him, and in turn, the ability we have to live as his people to reflect the love that he has shown to us, to live in the righteousness that he alone provides. And as we live in this new life that God provides, not only 
can we rejoice in the fact that he has given us a place in his kingdom? But we, we can share that good news. We can share that gospel with the world around us. We can share that with so many people who are trying to earn a place in God's kingdom by their own effort and work, we can point to Jesus and say, Jesus, our Savior, has done it all. He has lived, he has died, he has risen again. And through that message, many more can come to know who Christ is and come to know that salvation comes as a free gift of God's grace alone. And so may we always remember that through Christ we are dead to sin and alive to God. May we thank God with everything we say and do for the forgiveness that he has won for us. And, and so may we also be ready to join and say, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. Now may this grace of God who surpasses all human understanding may keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. shed his blood for me died that I might live on high lives that I might never die as the branches to the vine I'm his and he is mine oh the height of Jesus love Higher than the heavens above Deeper than the depths of sea Lasting as eternity Love that found me wondrous fall Found me when I sought Him not Only Jesus can impart to a wounded heart Peace that flows from sin forgive Joy that lifts the soul to have Faith and hope to walk with God In the way that He not trod Chief of sinners though I be Christ is all in all to me All my wants to Him are known All my sorrows are His own Safe with Him in earthly strife I await the heavenly life Strengthen me, O gracious Lord by your spirit and your word When my wayward heart went stray Keep me in the narrow way Grace in time of need supply While I live and wait